transport straight there. No wagon service. Buses in instead orderly enter Broxbourne. Also for the Stansted Express between Liverpool Street and the airport. No Northern Line. That suspended East Finchley to Charing Cross. Golders Green to Charing Cross. The bank branch is operating with the exception of Camden Town to Euston. Got severe delays for the eastbound District Line and no Hammersmith and City Line. Moorgate to Whitechapel. Also a quick look behind me. We've got an accident. That's on the North Circular westbound and that's just before the Crooked Billet roundabout. Laney. That's it. We'll be back in half an hour. Hello, uh, welcome back. You're watching Breakfast with Bill Turnbull and Natasha Kaplinski. And within the last uh, few minutes, we've just learnt that Francis Maud has joined Tory MPs trying to oust the party leader Ian Duncan Smith. Now, the former Shadow Chancellor has written to the chairman of the 1922 committee calling for a change of leadership. Now, the names of 25 MPs are required to trigger a leadership contest. So let's talk now to Tim Collins, who's Shadow Transport Secretary. He joins us from our Westminster studio. Mr Collins, good morning. Um, is this more writing on the wall or were you expecting it? Well, I think we were expecting it, yes, because it's been an open secret around Westminster for weeks that Francis has been one of the leading figures uh, seeking to destabilise Ian, briefing against him, etc. I actually think it's something of a mark of desperation uh, that such a senior figure amongst those who've been trying to remove Ian has had to out himself this morning. I think they're clearly not confident to get in the 25 names by tomorrow evening. They said they could do it. Ian has challenged them to do it. I don't think they will. Mm, it's a bit of an arbitrary deadline set, though, by Ian Duncan Smith. He's trying to draw the fire from the rebels, and he's got some. Well, I think the truth of the matter is it's the rebels who've been saying for weeks that they were going to get these 25 names within days. We were told last weekend it would happen uh, by Monday. We were told on Monday it would happen by Wednesday. Uh, they themselves have been saying that they're on the verge. Well, let them prove it. I don't think they will be able to prove it. Uh, and if they can't, then we will move forward as a party doing what we need to do, which is concentrate on getting rid of the government. Yeah, the problem, though, for Ian Duncan Smith is that um, outsiders, if you like, that we've spoken to, so experts in the field of presentation, say... The leader of the Tory party at present has uh, no charisma, no character, no warmth, no empathy. He's just not cutting it as a public leading figure. Well, that's a, that's a nice balanced assessment, isn't it? Not surprising, I don't agree with that. The challenge, actually, that Conservatives, I think, have to recognise is that constantly changing our leader is not the answer to our problems, and we can't ignore the polls, which actually show that all the very distinguished and excellent figures who've been talked about as possible alternative leaders, unfortunately, at the moment, are all less popular than Ian. Mm, wouldn't it be delightful, though, for the Labour Party if you kept on in Duncan Smith? They're the very man that they want to... He's the man that they want to run against in the next election. I think what would be delightful for the Labour Party is if the Tory party spent the two months up to Christmas in a divisive leadership election. Don't forget Lord Hutton's report will be coming out at that precise time. It may well be very, very damaging indeed to the Prime Minister. If there is no leader of the opposition at all in place at the time that the Hutton inquiry reports, that can only benefit Tony Blair. At what point does the Shadow Cabinet get together and say to Ian Duncan Smith, look, the game is up for the sake of the party, you've got to go? No, we're not going to do that. The Shadow Cabinet met last week and uh, unanimously supported Ian. We will do that, I'm sure, again this week. Uh, the truth of the matter is that the rebels have yet to get even the 25 names, just 15% of Conservative MPs, to trigger a vote of confidence. So that means that more than 85% of Conservative MPs have not asked for a vote of confidence. I think that puts things in the proper perspective. OK, Tim Collins, thank you very much. Thank you. Pat programme coming up now with a brief look at the rest of the morning's news, though. Here's Moira. Good morning. Many thanks. Morning to you. The U.S. Secretary of State, Colin Powell, has urged aid agencies not to pull out of Iraq. Mr. Powell was speaking after yesterday's bomb attacks in Baghdad, which killed at least 30 people and injured more than 200. One of the explosions was at the headquarters of the Red Cross. Leeds United has announced its annual results showing a record loss of £49.5 million. With debts of £80 million and languishing near the foot of the Premier League, it's a further blow to the troubled club. An official inquiry begins this morning into the handling of the construction of the Scottish Parliament building at Holyrood. The cost of the project has risen from an estimated £40 million six years ago to the current £400 million. Key figures involved in the affair will start giving evidence today. Colombian guerrillas say they will release the seven foreign tourists, including the Briton Mark Henderson, kidnapped last month. It follows negotiations with the imprisoned leader of the rebel group responsible. The hostages were taken 45 days ago while backpacking at ancient jungle ruins in northern Colombia. 
The Duchess of York's former dresser, who's currently serving a life sentence for the murder of her boyfriend, is in intensive care in hospital. Jane Andrews was rushed to hospital in Southend early yesterday morning after being found unconscious in her prison cell. It's thought she may have taken an overdose. Those are the main stories. Back to Bill and Natasha. Maury, thank you very much. Now here's a quick taste of what's coming up a little bit later on in the programme. One of the most powerful women in the beauty industry, Evelyn Lauder, is here to tell us about her love of photography. The horse that brought America out of the Depression. We're going to hear from Toby Maguire about the life of Seabiscuit. And another extraordinary lady, the former US Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, is here to tell us about life in Washington's corridors of power. And Rob's already seen her in the corridors of the BBC, haven't you, Rob? Yes, this yes, yes, yes. She's been shown to her dressing room. We'll be with you shortly. Excellent. Thank <laughs> you. Good morning to you. So it's even worse than feared. A pre-tax loss of very nearly £50 million for its last financial year has been announced by Leeds United this morning. It's the biggest figure ever for a publicly listed football club, while the club's total debt remains in the high 70 millions at 78. There's been hope that the new regime at Ellen Road, following the free spending of Peter Ridsdale, might improve matters in the long term, but there's no discernible sign of it yet, with the team, furthermore, floundering second from bottom of the Premiership. Nevertheless, the new man in charge says there is some reason for optimism. We've begun a turnaround, and that's really what my team's come in to do. And uh, what you will see in the results also is that we've managed to reduce... 20 million from our budget in the course of this year, so we should be in a, a break-even trading position uh, by the end of the year. We're well, live then to Ellen Road and to Gary Hewitt, treasurer of the club's Supporters Trust. Morning to you, Gary. Uh, Professor McKenzie talking things up, as you might expect. What do the fans think? Well, good morning, Rob. Um, well, I don't think there's really going to be any great surprise at today's figures. They don't make pleasant reading. But um, the new board have been very open and honest with fans since they came in. Uh, they've prepared us really for the worst. And it's quite clear that what we're seeing today is still a legacy of uh, the previous board's uh, problems and mismanagement. It's, and it's also clear that now as fans, we've got to unite behind the team, uh, vocally and financially, and put our trust in the new regime. So how do uh, the club break out of this vicious downward spiral, you think? Well, certainly the fans have got to play their part. We've got to keep bringing the money in through the turnstiles, through the club shop and, and uh, the, the, that money's got to be managed a lot better than it has been in the past. Uh, I see that, that being a, a real possibility. I'm confident, listening to Professor McKenzie's words this morning, that the changes he's put in place will see us eventually turn the corner. But it's, under no illusions, it's going to be a, a long job. Yes, uh, no prospect of a Russian sugar daddy like they have at Chelsea, I suppose. No, no, unless uh, <laughs> we can sort of drum up any billionaires around Leeds. We, we've certainly got some... Uh, it's nice to see some investment coming in from within the club. Our deputy chairman and uh, Arm Holdings have, have put some money into the club, and it's nice to see that sort of investment. Hopefully now Trevor Birch can bring in some more as well. Well, exactly. I mean, it's about investment in people too, isn't it? Trevor Birch comes to the club with a strong reputation, doesn't he, from Chelsea? He does, yeah. I think he's a, he's a man with both um, footballing and financial knowledge. Uh, it a, a, seems a real, a great appointment and um, I think we've got the right team in place now to, to start to turn the corner and to dig us out of the hole we find ourselves in. Now, I'm sure a lot of fans now will, uh, will share my confidence, I hope so, certainly. All right, Gary Hewitt, thank you very much. Gary Hewitt there thank at you. Supporters Trust, live from outside rather noisy Ellen Road. Uh, one further item for you, it's the 40 and 50-somethings in suits, not the 20-somethings in shorts. We'll have to answer to UEFA for the bust-up in the tunnel during England's match with Turkey in Istanbul earlier this month. Europe's governing body says there's insufficient evidence to charge the individuals concerned. Referee Pierluigi Colina, for example, declined to name names in his report, and so it's the English and Turkish FAs who'll be facing UEFA's disciplinary committee on Thursday. Fines are the most likely sanction. That's it. I'll be back tomorrow with more sport for you, including, of course, reports on those uh, uh, matches in the League Cup. Indeed. Carling Cup. Thank you very much, Rob. If, uh, if you heard a little bit of whispering uh, during that sports bulletin, it's because Natasha's been getting some tips already, beauty tips, from our next guest. She's been described as one of New York's most influential <laughs> business leaders and as the vice president of the cosmetics firm Estee Lauder. Her influence extends 
of course, right around the world. Yes, but Evelyn Lauder isn't just a businesswoman. She's also a key campaigner for breast cancer research and the woman who gave us the pink ribbon logo. And as you can see, she joins us now. And you're just about to give us a pink ribbon as well, aren't you? Absolutely. I have to pink. Okay. Put it on your left side. But you've got one with gorgeous diamonds in it. Can I not have one of those? <laughs> you could. You could. It might cost me a bit. <laughs> Bill, you need to put one on as well. Oh, but it is, a, it is a fantastic thing. Yes. Oh, well, no, just I'll call. spend the next five minutes stabbing my myself to death because right. I'm hopeless with pins. Okay, you carry on answering, for a good cause, asking but you are, questions. You are the, the brains do. behind the pink ribbon. Well, logo actually, so I, get involved? I started it with uh, Alexandra Penny from um, Self Magazine in the United States. And when I saw the pink ribbon, I said, this is fantastic. And what we must do is give them out at the counter for free, which we've been doing now for the last 10 years, 11 years. And we also give out a self-examination card so women know how to do self-examination. We encourage everyone to take mammographies um, once a year, once a person is 40, uh, because it has definitely been proven that early detection does save lives. You say 10 years. I mean, you've given out something like 30 million pink ribbons, oh, haven't you, e in about easily. 46 different <clears throat> countries. Yes, all over the world, yeah. to draw attention to breast health. Mm. Right, why, why did you decide to get into that particular issue? Well, I discovered that AIDS victims were dying at half the rate that women were dying of breast cancer. So they inspired me because I said there was no one who was really an advocate for women. And with twice as many women dying of breast cancer, uh, it needed to be someone who would really speak out in order to be able to get more funding from the federal government as well as, I think, power, giving women power. And knowledge is what gives us power. And the more stories one does about breast health, the more confidence a woman has not to be mutilated and to be able to um, really prevent this disease and also to be cured from it. It's an extraordinary campaign. I mean, also, as part of the Pink Ribbon campaign, you've been lighting up sort of landmarks around the world, haven't you? Tell us a little bit about that, because you were in London last night to light up the Royal Opera House L pink. Last night, the Royal Opera House was a gorgeous color pink. Oh, I wish I'd seen it. All mm. over the entire building. And um, it was to bring attention to the fact that um, we need to be sure to do the mammographies. Now, this was the last lighting that we did around the world, which began in um, the 1st of October. And it went from uh, Auckland, New Zealand, to Sydney, to the Orient. And then, uh, the, for example, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, the Tokyo Tower in Japan. We even did Graceland. Excellent. And we did Niagara Falls, mm. we did Table Mountain in Empire South Africa. Empire State Building as well. Empire it? State yeah. Building. Yeah. And uh, last night, the Royal Opera House, which was the end of the, it's the end of the month now. Mm. So that was the last lighting, along with an exhibition of my photographs, along with my book sale, which was at Selfridges with Elizabeth Hurley, who was signing Elizabeth Pink lipstick, <laughs> and I was signing books. And what's in the book? The book is a actually a collection of photography that I enjoy doing is my real hobby and my real love after making fragrances mm. and um, what I decided to do was make various chapters with different topics some is water some might be um, abstractions other pictures of people and so on and so forth it's certainly a very beautiful book but of course it's a good all, cause I was just right. about to say it's all the money all the, the